Okay, looks like the film started all right. That's, uh, that was uh, one of the crew pictures we took that kind of said what everybody was going to do on the mission, pretty much. Uh, you can only show uh, leaving the crew quarters so many times uh, and get something new out of it. And there's nothing new here except that the sun was going down by the time we got out of there um, because we were going to launch at uh, 7.30 in the evening down there at the Cape. It was a great day, beautiful, clear sky. And by the time we got ready for launch, though, it was pretty dark. Um, so it makes the things like the engine light off sequence pretty spectacular to, to see it at the night. Um, the engines worked fine and the orbiter worked fine and uh, we, we went right down through the count uh, very clean and at uh, 29 minutes after 7 in the evening those solids lit and we left. Um, it was a pretty spectacular sight we're told. People saw it as far north as uh, Carolinas and all the way down the south end of Florida and, and beyond. It was a great ride from where we were sitting. Uh, there was a lot of light. We were immersed in a field of light all the way uh, through ascent up till uh, we got off the uh, solid or the uh, tank after a main engine cutoff. But gee, it was a real nice ride, smooth ride uh, once you got off the solids, and uh, just a real nice push all the way up to uh, to Miko. Brian, why don't you tell them about the rest of it? Well, not only was it bright inside the cockpit, but uh, these people who were about three miles away had all their faces lit up. It looked like we were headed towards the moon, and that's what it looked like to us as well in the cockpit. For about three minutes or so, uh, every time I'd look up, I'd see the moon right in the center of my front window. Uh, we couldn't see any stars or the horizon, though, because of the glow all around the cockpit from the big fire behind us. We're coming up on uh, solid rocket booster separation here. Uh, I don't, this is my first flight, I don't know what it looks or feels like in the daytime, but at night it was spectacular. A great big orange flame enveloped the whole front end of the vehicle when the solids separated. Of course the G level went down from about two and a half G's to one G, and then from then on it was one continuous long push all the way to orbit. The first daytime scene that we saw once we got on orbit and came out of the Terminator here was Northwest Australia. Came pretty familiar with Australia. We saw it every day during the morning passes. Although this picture was shot a little later in the mission, it does, it does show you uh, what the cockpit arrangement was like. Uh, of course, we had changed clothes after ascent and, uh, and uh, got down to business here. We were checking out instruments, in this particular case, uh, the instruments in the front part of the cockpit. As is the commander's prerogative, he occasionally would inspect the ship, and we'll take you on a little tour here. He went down one of the inner deck accesses in a way that you can only do on orbit, and went down to see how the two payload specialists were doing in the mid-deck. We're coming right down on top of one of the experiments here as it leaves the lower part of the screen. That was the DMOS experiment that Mary will talk about later. You see Rodolfo Neri there who was uh, contemplating his experiments and the successes he'd been having during the day as he floated in zero gravity, and of course, Charlie in the corner. Uh, in the first three days, we had to launch three satellites, so uh, we didn't have too much time to enjoy the view right off the bat. We had to get ready to deploy. By the sixth orbit, we had Morelos ready to go. Here you see the Morelos spinning at 50 revolutions per minute, leaving the payload bay. It leaves with a resounding thump, and uh, we watched that track very smoothly and beautifully into the distance. Uh, after the Morellis deploy, we had another day before we had their next deploy, and uh, Rodolfo took plenty of that uh, opportunity to go ahead and take pictures of his homeland. This is Jerry Ross in the front seat now, and myself in the back, getting ready to deploy uh, the SATCOM. Here you can see SATCOM. It's a different geometric shape than uh, the Morellis. And again, as you watch that leave the payload bay, you can see it's a nice, smooth departure, and everything looks to be going just fine. Uh, we also deployed OSAT on day two, uh, but the OSAT deploy was a night deploy, and we weren't able to get uh, good photographs of that being in the dark. Here you can see the SATCOM again going away against the Earth's horizon. Now, after each and every satellite deploy, we uh, have to do a, an ohms burn for separation so that we'll be at a safe distance from the uh, satellite when it uh, fires its uh, kick motor. Here we can see the left ohms engine burn. And that's just the start up. The burn uh, lasts for a little while. And this is what it looks like in the mid-deck. And Jerry made it right into the airlock, and uh, we collected all those pieces. 
The uh, McDonnell Douglas electrophoresis uh, work on this flight uh, involved this uh, large cabinet uh, of apparatus, including the separation chamber itself, purifying uh, pharmaceutical or medical materials. Our material uh, that we are interested in as our first commercial material is uh, called erythropoietin, uh, a drug that uh, we hope to have available for use to fight uh, anemia, among other illnesses. Extraction of uh, a sample of the purified uh, portion of that material could be done like, uh, via a syringe, as you see me doing here. I could then use that syringe in a small chemistry set uh, type uh, arrangement of equipment to verify the uh, purity of that uh, material being separated in the device uh, in front of me in this picture. In this picture. Uh, Jerry and I discussing the next day's plans to go EVA or take our spacewalk. We had done a lot of water tank work and we did a lot more talking on orbit before we went out. One of the Mexican experiments consisted in observing the way that plants transport their nutrients. And I used uh, bromophenol blue dye on the leaf of each plant and a safranin dye on the root of the same plant, letting both dyes to be absorbed by each plant and then cutting the stems into different segments to be analyzed further in Mexico City by the PIs who proposed these uh, from the National University of Mexico. I was uh, real happy to get a chance to look at the globe from orbit, uh, being an environmental type. It was a great treat. We uh, got to eat Thanksgiving dinner together on orbit, which was a real different Thanksgiving dinner than I'd ever had before. Here's Charlie starting off with the uh, shrimp cocktail. Of course, Rodolfo was serious as usual. We never laughed at each other when we sort of made little mistakes. Uh, seating a dinner of seven is a little different in space because, you, as you can see, you can sit on a wall, sit on the floor, and also sit on the ceiling. Um, we had irradiated turkey out of little green bags, uh, same color as U.S. Army eats, I believe, Woody. And, uh, it was actually pretty good. You had to be a little careful uh, uh, to keep the fluid on the turkey. We had fresh bread. Um, we had the uh, treat of having tortillas on orbit, be probably because Rodolfo was there. And we found out that they are by far preferable to bread making sandwiches when there's no gravity. We ate uh, cranberry sauce from the same company that everybody else did. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was the boss uh, sort of overseeing our dinner. And Jerry uh, sort of topped off the dinner table by sitting on the ceiling over there. <laughs> this is uh, Brewster and Brian and Mary in the uh, flight deck. They're preparing for the first of the two spacewalks. This doesn't show up, but they had a real plethora of uh, cameras in the aft flight deck, and you'll see some examples of that later on. Meanwhile, Woody and I were down in the mid-deck, and we're preparing our 35-millimeter cameras uh, to go outside. We had to put some uh, special covers on them to protect them thermally and uh, to set up the lenses properly. Mid-deck gets pretty crowded when we have uh, the third EMU out there in the mid-deck and both of us are trying to get into our suits. It's a lot easier, I think, to get into the suits in 0G than it was in 1G. You can see me entering the end of the hatch there, going into the airlock, and uh, Woody is to follow here. And uh, Brian was our, our IVA aide-de-camp helping us get suited up, and he did a super job. You can see us uh, squirming, trying to get up into our hard upper torsos, which uh, formed the upper half of our suits. The first time we got in the suits, it was a pretty tight fit, but by the time we got them into them on the second EVA, it was a, a much uh, smoother ingress into the suits, I think partially because we had uh, press fit them to our form on the first EVA. This is Brewster in the aft flight deck. He was uh, keeping a close eye on us at all times. Besides operating the cameras, he was making sure that we weren't going to get into any trouble. This is a good view of us. Uh, performing the access build. This is Woody in the, with his back to us in the foot, front foot restraint, and I'm uh, facing the cabin in the back. We had just completed uh, one bay of the access truss, and we are starting to take components out to uh, start another bay. That uh, served us very well. The access went essentially as we had seen it on the ground. There was no surprises. Here you can see a view out the one of the overhead windows in the uh, cockpit. As the truss nears completion, it was a total of 45 feet long, and uh, the three of us, Mary, Woody, and myself, uh, dubbed ourselves the Ace Construction Company with the supporting crew of the rest of the crew, and uh, we put up our advertisement after we'd completed the construction of the first access truss. Our motto is, uh, we'll build a suit anywhere, and uh, we'd be happy to do that again anytime. Um, as you can see here, I was flying the arm, looking in the upper overhead window. You can sort of see Jerry doing his Superman Im imitation there. Um, 
after working a lot of hours in a simulator flying Captain Cardboard around, it was really a treat to be able to give these guys a ride. And uh, they were real cooperative, giving me great GCAs. Here you can see them saluting a the flag up on the uh, MFR, which was really fun to see. Uh, here, Jerry is demonstrating running a cable, um, like if you were going to run a, an electrical cable in a space station. I just took him straight up the structure and straight down again. Uh, we did notice a couple inches of drift at that point in time. Um, I'll tell you, before I was taking these guys out and here they're doing a build of Bay 10, it was really funny. They sat down in the airlock for about 40 minutes and just really pumped me up talking about what a great guy I was until I got <laughs> them flailing around on the end of the arm. And it was really a good time. The arm flies wonderfully. It's just such a great tool, um, real smooth and uh, no surprises. And the most amazing thing for me was watching them pick up this thing, which was the equivalent of a four-story building, this truss, um, access truss, and just twirl it around um, with very little effort and it imparted very little motion into the arm. I expected more arm dynamics and we didn't get it. So um, it, all in all, it was a lot of fun uh, being able to interact with them and, and they gave me some real good directions while we were up there. Well, this next sequence was a uh, set of uh, special filming that was done for data collection on the construction of the Ease hardware. This was shot at six frames per second and we're showing it to you at 24 frames per second, so uh, that accounts for the slightly keystone cop effect that you're seeing. The, uh, the person that was working in the foot restraint, and in this case it happens to be Woody, had a pretty good workstation, and uh, even though he was very busy, he felt fairly comfortable with his work. Uh, I was free floating for this build, and as you'll see, we'll both go up and uh, take the next <coughs> beam up together. That also seemed fairly comfortable, we thought, being able to have one person on each end of the beam. The beam was uh, controllable and it wasn't an excessive amount of uh, hand strength required to maintain body position and to align the beam for attachment. By the way, this I think was the eighth of the eight builds we did of ease on the first of the two EVAs and we were uh, felt pretty well up the learning curve by that time and uh, I think that accounts for the, uh, the smoothness with which uh, the assembly went on this particular uh, time. Relatively smooth. Relatively smooth. <laughs> Our hands by this time were uh, getting uh, relatively tired. Uh, the suit with a body inside it weighed in our neighborhood of four to 450 pounds. Uh, the beams each weighed 60 pounds or so. And when you're trying to maintain your body position and still torque those tubes around and then uh, line them and attach them, it gets your hands uh, fatigued rather rapidly. This is probably not the preferred way of assembling a space station, something more akin to access where the crew members are stationary in foot restraints is, uh, is uh, preferred. But for certain applications, uh, I think we've demonstrated that crew free floating, especially if you have a crew member on each end of a beam, uh, is certainly uh, an, an adequate way to do certain types of construction in uh, limited uh, applications. You can see me kicking my heels together there at the end of the, the last build. This, this is a this shows me starting to uh, pick up these on the second EVA we uh, constructed them again and then we were able to release them and manipulate them and this shows me manipulating the entire ease structure now that structure weighs about four structure weighs about four and the center of gravity of it is about six feet in front of me Jerry and I both had the opportunity to manipulate this and again it was very easy to do uh, we could uh, just run it end over end from side to side uh, as long as we kept the rates down fairly slow it was not a problem at all after we were done doing this we were able to reinsert it right into the socket that it came from which uh, required accuracy down to the centimeter level and it was not a particular problem now we did run into a problem during the flight in that we could not replace a, a very simple pit pin and that gave us uh, about a 30 second consternation then we decided to go ahead and move over to the next uh, rack of clusters and just uh, continue on with the EVA While we're on orbit, we also had uh, another job, which is uh, really not hard at all, and that's to look at the Earth. And uh, that's probably the most fun part of all. Uh, this shows us just coming over the Baja and crossing the Baja into mainland Mexico, where uh, Rodolfo was able to take many, many pictures, and uh, he is extremely, and so are all the Earth observation people, pleased with the results. Here he knows he's got another winner. Good picture. <laughs> now, this shows us, com this shows us coming down... Uh, off the Red Sea, in this picture you can see the Nile, the Sinai Peninsula, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Suez, along with the Arabian Desert. Uh, this area 
It was not an area that we were able to see most of the time, so that's very special to us to even have this picture. By the way, uh, north is pointing on the bottom of the picture or south is to the top. Mary took most of these motion picture earth views that we've got, and this is one way she did it. Another one was to have a special bracket that literally held the camera to the window and uh, take the photos. For this particular photo, we're coming off the Atlantic Ocean and coming onto the west coast of Africa. We're uh, just north of Dakar, entering the Western Sahara. This is an area that in past flights had been particularly dusty uh, due to all the uh, dust storms and uh, the, the crop burning that they had done in the past. But again, we were quite lucky in getting some very pretty and, uh, and good visibility shots. Well, uh, it's all uh, good things that come to an end too soon. And here's a picture of Charlie and Rodolfo down in the mid-deck during the uh, re-entry phase of the mission. I stood up for a, a good share of the mission and took some pictures out the aft overhead windows. And you can see some of the uh, plasma recombination effect in the wake of the orbiter as we uh, start to re-enter the Earth's upper atmosphere. Picture of uh, Brewster and Brian as they're monitoring the vehicle. This was our first roll maneuver about Mach 24, 24 times the speed of sound. You can see we rolled up on the wing to about 90 degrees of uh, bank angle. And again, if you look at the bottom of the screen there, you can see that uh, plasma recombination. It uh, was a bright orange glow, just like on a match or in your fireplace. It stuck with us for quite a while. We see the same view here uh, that you do from 200 miles, only now we're down to 250 or 240,000 feet. And you're still going just as fast as you were. So it looks like you're really screaming in right on top of the, of the clouds. The vehicle knew exactly what to do. It's a great guidance system and it did everything exactly right all the way down. We had a real smooth ride. We didn't in, in, uh, encounter any turbulence in the upper atmosphere. Uh, Charlie and Rodolfo uh, enjoyed the ride down. I think it was uh, a very pleasant experience. When we crossed the west coast, we were at Ventura there, and that's the city you see, Ventura and Oxnard. As we rolled for the last roll maneuver, right at the end of this scene, you can see the clouds as they uh, came up across the mountains and uh, were over the desert area. As we turn on to final, uh, we could finally see the uh, runway environment at Edwards, and not until we started turning on to final. Uh, as we rolled out onto the final approach, there was some clouds in front of us. Uh, we have two aim points out there, a nominal and a close-in aim point. We were supposed to be going to the nominal. It was behind the clouds. We could only see a little bit of the close-in aim point. But the heads-up display showed us that our navigation and guidance systems were doing very well, and so we could use them to point ourselves at the ground uh, until we broke out of the clouds and then could see the uh, aim, could see the uh, aim beneath. Pre-flare and everything uh, after that went uh, nominally. Brian put the gear down at uh, about 300 feet, right on the money, and uh, the rest of its history. It's uh, pretty much from here on, just like landing any glider uh, or any airplane with the uh, power pulled back. We landed, as you know, on the concrete Edwards 22 runway out there. I guess we were about 2,500 feet down the runway or so, and uh, 190 knots uh, at touchdown, and the rest of the rollout went uh, pretty nominally. As the nose comes down there, you can see the speed brake is full out. Uh, we had very little crosswind and about five knots of tailwind on this landing. This is a shot that Jerry got by placing that same camera that he had used up earlier in entry into the uh, side hatch window. And you can see, just as the nose is coming down, how fast it looks like we're going down the runway. It's quite a bit faster than uh, you would see out your window on an airliner. Touchdown is over 200 miles per hour, and at this point, with the nose on the ground, we're about 190 miles per hour. Uh, Brewster uh, began braking about 130 miles an hour, and uh, he'll go into that. Uh, the, it's a nice long runway, so we didn't need to get on the brakes very hard. Uh, we didn't put much energy into them, and consequently, when the folks looked at the wheels, brakes, and tires after uh, landing rollout, they were all in pretty good shape. So they were able to tow the vehicle right off the runway and get Edwards back into flying operations uh, as soon as they could. You'll see us come down the steps here, and uh, it's pretty remarkable, I think, how well everyone looks. Everybody's in really good shape. We all felt uh, real good getting back into 1G, didn't have any... Uh, uh, adverse uh, conditions from the uh, seven days in uh, zero-g and everybody was uh, pretty excited and uh, real pleased with the way the whole thing had gone. <laughs>